What a great day to be speaking about uh, mental well-being and our relationship with the online world, uh, the world around us, uh, and also our own selves. Um, what we uh, what we were hoping to do over the course of an hour is um, uh, really to look at what some of these relationships are like. There is there is the good and there is the bad. There is the dependence, but there is the um, the over dependence uh, that goes sometimes into negative behaviors. Uh, but really, it is it's not about um, sort of making any absolute uh, judgment calls on uh, either the internet or our relationship with it. Uh, I think it's really more um, to uh, look at. Uh, how we relate to ourselves in the digital world, as well as in this new sort of uh, ever evolving uh, global climate that we that we find ourselves in. Um, it's it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, you know, uh, for me, uh, Amaha is a very personal journey. And uh, when I joined uh, Dr. Amit Malik in uh, 2019 uh, in building this out, uh, the idea really was to be able to create accessible, affordable and um, uh, appropriate mental health care for everybody who is who's out there ready and willing to to seek it and so uh, it's a very personal journey for both amit and myself and uh, as collaborators kavita and ira we've done a lot of work together uh, children first and, and amaha as well and uh, and also agastya foundation and the message really is to be able to um, be able to decode some of these uh, and and try and remove some of the restrictions so that we can actually um, find some solutions um, and find um, some uh, a better way to relate, I suppose, uh, in this very complicated world. Um, so let's start perhaps by just talking about, you know, we, we've put some broad terms out there. We've talked about mental health and uh, this idea of uh, general well-being and specific conditions. And so it'd be great to just sort of maybe pull uh, Kavita into the conversation and, and just begin by a quick framing of what it, what it means when we talk about mental health and mental well-being and as against mental illness. Um, and then also this uh, this broad framing of the internet and the digital world and various social media channels and what does that sort of um, encompass. And um, and then we can start exploring the relationship we, we have with that. So Kavita, do you want to sort of give us a quick uh, summary? How many hours do we have? <laughs> Those are very broad questions, but I'm going to try and um, answer uh, everyone has mental health because everyone has health. And uh, traditionally, um, in the more Western concept, we've tried to say that physical health is different from mental health, is different from spiritual health. Uh, but often in, in the indigenous or the Indic wisdom, we have said that the person is one whole person and mental, spiritual, physical is all together. However, when we popularly nowadays term mental health, then we often mean um, uh, the part of our inner world that is often only accessible to us, but will manifest in our actions, in our behaviors, in our language, and the way we interact with the world. Um, but it's internal and invisible often, and only accessible to us through work that we do. I think the paradox of the world today is that the bridge between what is in our inner world and our awareness of it is something that has to be worked towards and is not easily available to us. So I think that's what, to me, mental health means. Am I accessing my inner world? And therefore, am I aware of my um, how it is impacting everything I do and my being? So that's my attempt at uh, saying what mental health is. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think uh, you know when we're talking about the internet and uh, the digital in general, we're looking at all the social media platforms and uh, the varying levels of engagement uh, that that we have with them. Uh, but really, it's it's about um, look, just stepping back from that and saying, you know, what is it that is, uh, you know, what is it that this new era is is um, giving to us as possibilities, and uh, how do we make the most of it, and so on. I mean, we know that in India now we have almost uh, 400 million people. That's over 40 percent of our population. Uh, that is uh, on the internet, and um, perhaps about 65% of it is on various social media channels. Uh, we know today that people are spending upwards of five hours uh, online, and um, you know there are there there are many positives to that, right? They are exploring it for learning opportunities. Access has become possible in a way that it wasn't before. Um, people are being able to collaborate, and uh, geography and other things have stopped being a deterrent in, in many cases. At the same time, we're seeing many challenges emerge as well, right? Uh, so I'd love to uh, begin this conversation by just setting it 
in the various development stages of of a, of a child and adolescent uh, uh, and uh, you know through the teen years uh, into adulthood and maybe pull kavita in to just just sort of break it down for us the experience of this digital world as we go across our lifespan um yeah. and what it, what the gives are at each stage and perhaps what we get out of that experience right because it's slightly different at each stage and maybe once we lay that out across the development years it will help us then address uh, different segments of uh, of that uh, demographic so oh, so sure. um uh, so there are two things i'd like to say here one is that uh we are still finding out the effect of the internet and this entire uh, sort of macro ecosystem of the internet on the development of human beings because for someone like me at my age um i didn't grow up in the initial years with the internet so the development was different and then in each decade there has been a significant development in the stages of how the internet itself has evolved and our relationship with it so i think what i will try and do is to start with the children that we see now and work backwards to say that what we are seeing is when a child is is exposed to the internet at a very young age which is the uh, children growing up in the last 10 to 15 years really uh, where access to internet whether it is the smartphone or it is the tv or it is uh, uh, the net through other means has become uh, all pervasive so you see two year olds also now knowing what a smartphone is also now knowing what a youtuber is it has affected development in a certain way which i think it's it's difficult to say whether it's good or bad but we are seeing this development that there are certain sensory systems that are developing much more strongly in these children than others so for example the visual and the auditory which really if you're exposed to more of the screen then the visual and auditory system is the one which is being overused um and also superimposed was covid in the lockdown where one of the most um, important ways for these if we are thinking of the under fives then two years of their lives were spent um actually locked inwards and uh, what what we've started seeing is that some of the developmental milestones of the hands have started changing that children are starting to do this at a much earlier age than we managed to do and it is the scrolling up and down that is coming at even two uh which wasn't there the use of fingers traditionally is not seen at that age with such precision such nuance and the use of being able to so i see two year olds today being able to identify just by scrolling which song on youtube they need to get to they don't know how to read so they're not reading the labels they've actually figured out through scrolling through hundreds which one they want so there is a change in the cognitive or in the in the way that the brain is developing basis the availability and the access to and the predominant access to the internet at a much younger age at the same time some of these children some not all if we are not mindful if this is leading to a decrease in use of body and movement again i would say covid was also responsible but one of the other big things that we see is the screen and the uh, and the uh, uh, and the sense of not being safe outside in outdoor spaces especially in the urban areas which has led to children therefore not accessing the use of their movement bodies and multi sensory systems they're using the sense of smell as well as balance as well as movement all together so i think in the under 5 a large part of what we see is an overuse of certain systems and therefore development of other systems not as much this can have later impacts in life but i'm not going to go there uh by the time the child is reaching the preteen and then the teenage um what we are seeing is that because there are peers who are starting to use independently often times this is the time that children are getting more and more especially in the urban areas getting more and more exposed earlier it was only for entertainment now it is education entertainment as well as social connect um for video calling etc and um what's starting to happen is at this point in time one of the hallmarks that's becoming is am i socially connected in my tween years and do i have a sense of self in this macro ecosystem and that then goes into the teen years where a large part of this macro ecosystem is also about who am i there versus who am i at home who am i at school so the larger macro ecosystems that most of our children are exposed to um uh, our home neighborhood um uh, schools 
whatever activities you're doing as well as the internet. Um, and, and that's where many of our teens and young people are opting to or choosing to, due to various reasons, um, include the macro ecosystem of the internet into their daily lives quite a lot. Um, and uh, access to it and the relationship with it is starting to have an impact on their development in the social emotional as well as the psychological realm. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other uh, sort of warning signs, the amount of time that it is being used may mean that some of the other things that we want to grow or we want them to be able to grow are not being given enough time. And that's something that we sometimes need to look at. What's the balance? And therefore, uh, what parts of the brain, mind and uh, self are developing there? By the time you've reached adulthood, um, I think it's a lot to do with your occupation as well, your employment, how you're connecting to each other but also often for entertainment purposes and also to, um, uh, there are a huge amount of uh, adults as well where uh, they're looking as uh, at self-worth also through the validation um, on the net, on the social media. Um, of course, uh, there's news and there's, uh, there's cricket and there's all kinds of different things that you can also access um, via the net. So um, that's, where, that's where I'll stop for the time being. Yeah, thank thank you for that. Uh, and and you know, as we as we see in, even in the Amaha context for adults, um, you know, when it comes to workplace absenteeism, presenteeism, uh, the the productivity uh, aspect, when it comes to um, you know the relationship uh, challenges, whether at work or at home, uh, as a result of uh, sort of preoccupations. I mean, those are all trends that we're we're seeing. But I'd I'd love to sort of just pull um, uh, Ira in and, and you know just reflect on this idea of. Uh, whether it's sort of social acceptance or validation or instant gratification or whatever it is that people are seeking when they are perhaps um, uh, in engaging in the online world, perhaps in an unhealthy way. Is it something that in your experience, also as a user yourself, as someone who's used the, the, the digital platform as an advocacy tool, uh, but also seeing so many young people, has it been your experience that it is something that, it, that is helping people connect and stay closer to themselves or get, get further away? And um, would love to hear your reflections around, um, uh, around sort of what some of these behaviors uh, mean to you. Um, first of all, I love your definition of mental health, Kavita. I am most definitely going to watch this video and transcribe it and then save it uh, for every other time I'm asked to describe, define mental health. I find that all of these things come back to finding a balance, um, whether it is about social media or anything else in your life. And um, I think the difference with technology and the internet and social media is, is just the, the proximity and the access that has just skyrocketed um, based on what we were used to, right? And so the thing is that now, whether you use it to connect with other people or you're using it uh, or, or you're getting addicted to it or whatever your relationship to it is, it's just so close to you. Um, and while I was, you know, thinking about this for this webinar specifically, um, I realized that um, um, so like whether it's uh, healthy or not, sort of depends on whether you're able to regulate it or not. Um, and if I'm, uh, sorry, can you repeat the main part of your question again? Because I don't want to go on a tangent. Yeah, I mean, I think we were talking about the motivations and when it, when it comes to adults, young adults and adults across ages to look at the need for validation, the need for uh, instant gratification, acceptance. Uh, are we using the internet as a way to express ourselves and come closer to ourselves and stay connected with ourselves and others? Or is it something that is taking us away from ourselves? Uh, and what's your experience? Yeah, so I feel like because validation and... Uh, love and connection is something that we all want so badly, no matter 
whether we want to accept it or admit it or not. Um, like I said, the proximity of that makes it so much easier to try and access it from the internet than otherwise. Um, so if it's easier for me to keep posting, keep sharing, keep obsessing, because it's so close to me, I can just press a button and open it on my phone. Um, it's harder for that to become an unhealthy uh, obsession than it would be if I did not have that. Um, which is sort of why I started by saying uh, it's about finding a balance. Because I don't think it's that, um, I feel like the need to connect is the same. Right. Uh, what the internet has done is it's allowed you to be able to exploit that need to connect because it's given you so many, many more ways to connect and such easy access to connect. Um, and so then it goes back to whether through your development years, through your relationships with other people, are you able to build that security in yourself? Um, are you able to um, regulate yourself? Um, because so in real life communication, we have these filters, right? Especially polite, all of these things. So we've, we, we learn as we grow up to um, impulse control, to set all of these things. But we've been taught to do that in real life conversations. Not really been taught to do that on the internet. Um, and... I don't know what it is about. I, I think it's the proximity that makes it so addictive, makes it so easily go out of your control. Um, and I think just as a symptom of that, uh, we see this kind of need for validation. And so I think it's given, more than anything, it's given a, uh, uh, you know how, it, uh, when you, when you, uh, so there was a lot of, there's a lot of TV in India. And then when testing got better, the number of TV cases spiked. So I don't think the need for connection has increased or any of those things. I think the thing showing the whole world that everybody wants to connect uh, now exists. Yeah. So yeah. Seeing and and I know if I could just um, maybe uh, ask a more um, a specific question to your own personal experiences. You are someone who has been very open about your own mental health journey. Um, and I remember watching a, a wonderfully courageous, uh, vulnerable, beautiful video of yours uh, where you talked about some of the challenges that you've had. And you so you used one of the social media platforms to to be able to get that message out. And also as the same person today. Um, using various uh, online advocacy platforms uh, with Agastu Foundation to get the message of mental health recovery and therapy. So these are two very different relationships and needs that you have sort of used and engaged uh, with the internet uh, for. Would love to hear how, how that felt for you in each of those situations and also how the world responded, you know? So uh, your journey and your struggle was the feel like and, and what has been some of the successes and benefits of using the internet now uh, in a way to do advocacy work for mental health? Um, so I uh, realized that privacy is always a big topic that comes up uh, for anyone in the public uh, sphere. Um, and I think... The only thing I want to say about that is that you make an informed decision. So when I decided to post my video about my vulnerable, about the vulnerable aspects of my life um, on social media, I thought about it very, very, for very long before I took that call. Um, and so for me, it worked, um, uh, it worked to my advantage because I had had this intense experience of depression and uh, I was afraid that people won't get it. I was afraid that, so uh, when I see someone else who is feeling those feelings, I'm afraid for them. So 
I just fear the feeling of depression, whether it's in me, whether it's in somebody else. I am just very afraid of those feelings. Um, and so even though I had ups and downs and would get better and whatever, the fact that other people could possibly still be going through this feeling made me feel this sense of urgency. And so then what the internet allowed me to do was it gave me a platform to talk about this and to address my need to get it, get this message across to so many people. Um, so that was great. Um, I did get lots of unhelpful, hateful messages. Um, but uh, I don't read the comment section of my uh, Instagram. In fact, there's an option. You can go and click and say that only your, only the people you follow comments appear on top. So as soon as I reach a name that I don't know, I just stop reading. So I only read my friends' comments. Um, and that's why through this whole, uh, while I was thinking about this entire conference, it kept coming back to me that the internet is a tool. And that's just the bottom line answer for every question that you're going to ask me. Because um, I decide when I get to use it for what. Um, and then it's a tool that is being used by human beings. So it is going to portray what people are like and what humanity is like, whether that is the good side of it or the bad side of it, whether it is exploitative or not, it is created by human beings. And um, then it's a tool. Some of it is in your control and some of it is not in your control. On Instagram, if someone puts a trigger, if it's a carousal post, someone puts a trigger warning in the first post. The second time you're scrolling, Instagram will just automatically show you the second picture. So now I've missed the trigger warning. And maybe I didn't want to see that post. Now, the creator of the content has put a trigger warning. But because Instagram's algorithm wants you to see multiple pictures, it's gone to the second one. And I was like, I wanted that trigger warning. So there's certain things where the tool is manipulating you and there's certain ways in which you manipulate the tool. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and the last part about that I wanted to add is about how it's still us humans using it. So uh, if I post too much about mental health, my followers will decrease. Um, so I have to strategically make sure I put up something, just my face every now and then so that people still want to look at my Instagram. Um, and I know this. So I manipulate that uh, to make sure that you see my content. So yes, it's unfortunate that um, people care far less about uh, what I want to say about mental health. Um, but now that I know that, I, I will manipulate you. I will put up a picture of something that you care about and then put up a picture of something that I care about. Um, so it goes, it goes both ways. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I think it's also, it also reveals, you know, we talk about the person posting and their relationship and their identity with themselves, but it's also the people viewing, right? And receiving. What What is the state of mind uh, that people are coming into each of these um, whether they're looking at posts or something on Instagram, or what is that state of mind, right? And, um, you know, Kavita, I'd love to sort of just reflect on some of these negative traits that we pick up on saying, okay, there is uh, sort of, uh, there, there is self-harm content, there is stuff that is around uh, cyberbullying, you know, Ira, you mentioned around cyber hate and various things, but ultimately these are just an expression of, you know, what, what human beings are, are going through and what they would do in any case, right? It's just that it's now in, in our phone and in our hand uh, all the time. So Kavita would love for you to just distill out, I mean, how these are, and, you know, there are some extreme examples of this. I mean, we've, we've known of uh, the blue whale and other such uh, sort of video games that have encouraged young people to go uh, to, you know, down the self harm and um, uh, also sort of commit gross acts uh, in that in that process and then you know there there is there is hatred and there's bullying and all of that so how would you look at you know how much would you how much blame would you ascribe to the internet and the digital world and how much responsibility would you suggest we all take for our own selves uh, as individuals and as a community at large mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I feel like a judge. Uh, <laughs> um, let me try and go back to what uh, Ira said, that proximity is one of the things that has changed the game completely. So I would add one more thing, uh, proximity and access. And I'd like to take a minute to understand that. And I'm looking at it from the point of view of the child and the young adult as well. Whatever ecosystems that we have in our world that have come about over time, civilization, societies have made certain structures in which children are nurtured. There is a family, you live in a home. Uh, many who are fortunate to live in homes which are, um, you know, you're well cared for, will live in a home where outside there will be a gate. You're living in a society, there is a guard. So all strangers who enter, there is somebody to stop them, question them. Then you answer a doorbell. The three-year-old usually will not uh, answer the doorbell. It will be the adult in the house who will check who has come. These are inherent gatekeeping measures that we have built into our structures, into our homes, into our neighborhoods, into our schools. A stranger can't enter a school and meet a child. Now, because we have built these social structures over time, we've spent enough time in constructing these innately and we take these for granted. However, when the internet was created as a macro ecosystem, the access for a child does not have these gates. There are potential tick box gates, but there are actually no gates. There is nobody who's checking what this content is, who is reaching out to my child. And this is becoming one of the biggest issues. And then we are telling children, don't do it. But first we are actually creating an ecosystem which we are introducing them to. And the ecosystem itself has expanded and populated and developed into a very different place. So I think some of what happened with the blue whale, what happened with children watching certain videos and then enacting them was born out of so much unawareness of the impact of no gatekeeping and providing content without understanding developmentally appropriate measures for children, young adults, and otherwise, and I think we are still in the era where we haven't actually figured out um, what the potential impact is as we are growing. Um, it's only recently, so the, the talk about addiction has been ongoing for a very long time. Is the internet addictive or not? Is, is gaming addictive or not? For the first time, it's in the last three years or so, that only internet gaming is used as a word, as a disorder. So whatever you're doing on social media, whatever your self-image is, has not yet found, found its way into the books, into the classification systems. Your number of hours of TV viewing or screen viewing is not part of the nomenclature right now. The only nomenclature right now we have, which is seen as pathological or part of a system of addiction, is internet gaming disorder. Yeah, so I think this is still something that we are making. There is a huge gap between how uh, our social structures are promoting the development of the internet itself. The social media, the internet, the algorithms, the AI, what is being spent and what is being um, uh, what is being nurtured and what is being grown over there and the extent of it and the organized bits of it are not the same as the people who are trying to say can we also figure out some structures that protect the vulnerable? And the vulnerable could mean people with mental health issues. The vulnerable could mean people who have social anxiety and are using the internet sometimes to reach out for connection, not knowing what the consequence could be. Or on the other hand, people who haven't been able to, for example, reach out and make real relationships because they've been inside homes and cannot go out due to certain reasons. They've actually benefited from making social connections via the internet as well. So, like Kyra said, it's a tool. And I think what we what we may need to do more of as a society, as adults, is to figure out who is the vulnerable population that may need a little bit more of thinking through before handing proximity access 
are there people who actually will not find it helpful at this stage of their lives and i don't think enough thought and mindfulness has gone into it or is going into it i think we are catching up by saying a disorder has already occurred let's label it so i think that's where the gap seems to be right now and it is more of a social gap uh, i don't think it is about the internet as much but in how our relationship with the uh web development has occurred as a species i think we are we are really running in terms of internet development and how we are developing technology versus not running so much in the ethical the moral and the socio emotional fields of how we are governing how the governance of a tool like this uh is is being uh, done so i think broadly that's that's my answer there are, there there are a lot of different warning signs that seem to be occurring right now and i i would say that um the younger population seems to be far more vulnerable um uh, although i don't think it is limited to the uh, vulnerable uh, or to the younger adults or the younger uh, children uh, i do think that there are enough adults um who also are part of the vulnerable population and um, yeah i i think enough thought has not gone there from our side now i think it's not the internet it is it is us as uh, as people who, who who own accountability for social structures uh, i think that's where the responsibility lies yeah. and you know you make the point about collective responsibility and collective reflection including the role of different stakeholders whether it's schools or institutions or colleges workplaces we tend to we tend to see a problem or a problem child or a problematic situation and label that person right uh, but i think it's also important drawing from what you're saying that the responsibility sits in all our institutions and our social structures to see how we can better protect and better equip uh individuals and uh, and the second point you made uh, which is sort of really important to look at is who are, who are these people on the internet all of us right and and people are at varying degrees of vulnerability um and uh, of of uh, different uh, different sort of uh, mental health uh, or mental illness uh, stages now just to try and break that down a little bit i mean we've talked about um sort of uh, uh, functioning adults as productive members of society or or school in schools and colleges and in workplaces but there are also many many vulnerable people out there uh, people who are perhaps dealing with anxiety disorders or depressive disorders and yes 200 million people with diagnosed mental health conditions and these are pre covid numbers right and so if you look at the over 20 million people with psychotic disorders or or um, addiction or um, any of these other challenges that they already have this is before they have their challenges have got compounded as a result of their internet usage right um so how do we actually think about protecting some of those populations also there is a lot of content and and ira coming to you also there's a lot of content that is catering to those people so there's a lot of goodness particularly that we've seen in the covid era where a lot of these people who could not otherwise get help who could not afford it who could not get out of their homes or um you know find uh, care in their cities i mean at amaha we work with people across 300 indian cities in 16 languages right so that kind of ability to be able to reach care wherever it is uh, is also a positive sign and so uh, you know it, it, covid has has shown us how we can how we can access it in a very positive way for these vulnerable populations um would love to do a quick round of reflections on that uh, i'd like to hear from you and then maybe kavita um i actually had this uh, video that i watched by andrew huberman who is a cognitive neuroscientist and i found it that it relates very much to what we're talking about today so it's a video about motivation and dopamine and about how um we think of dopamine as a hit whereas it's not about the hit so basically what he says is if uh if it takes me effort to walk from here to there and i get a reward i will uh i will enjoy the pleasure i get from that reward will be more than if you just came and gave me the thing i had to walk from here to kavita to get my vada pav i will enjoy that vada pav far more than if i sat here and kavita just handed me the vada pav the thing is i would still enjoy the vada pav even if i sat here and got it but uh my motivation will not be impacted so when we have um and he says 
Addiction is a progressive narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure. Because I can sit on my phone and order sweetie, uh, I'm inherently putting in less effort. And, but I'm still getting the pleasure. So in terms of this proximity and access thing that we were talking about, because of technology and the internet, mm-hmm. pretty much everything that we do has become less effort. Whether we intended that as a society or not, everything that we do takes less effort. I did not have to consciously make sure I'm putting in effort so that I get enough dopamine and motivation to do hard things. Because before technology, my regular life required me to walk to the supermarket to get my groceries, to go to go out for dinner, to go out to watch a movie. So I didn't have to think and self-regulate and be like, Ara, you need to put in a little more effort into your regular day-to-day life Otherwise, you can start feeling unmotivated because not enough of the correct hormones and chemicals are being released into your body. And so, um, this is a time where uh, knowledge of knowledge is helping us um, because if I know these things, I can make sure that I sometimes go out and get groceries just because it's going to increase the amount of motivation I have to do other things. Um, and so, and the other thing that I, that is kind of like a society thing is that my Instagram is showing me content that's entertaining me and it's also giving me an ad on Amaha. So, it's not just, uh, it, it's combining my uh, utility and my entertainment into one thing, right? Um, and of course, they're doing this because I want the entertainment and you want, not Amaha, but like whatever, internet, any anything that's trying to make its way there um, is trying to get my attention through my entertainment. So now for everything, I'm going to Instagram. I shop on Instagram. I find doctors on Instagram. I watch posts on Instagram. It's all a mess. Uh, If I'm looking for a doctor, I might get caught up in the next reel that I found, right? So it's just like this big thing. Um, And uh, um, yeah, and so this access and, and proximity thing is really... Reducing the amount of effort that we need to do anything, which is automatically making things addictive and reducing it. So in that sense, um, I think the solutions to these things, um, I mean, I don't know how we can convince people to be like, don't use the internet to sell things. It's not good for people. Uh, People's mental health, please don't do that. We can't do that, right? But what we can do is we can teach ourselves to self-regulate from when we're kids. From a young age, we can teach ourselves what it means to self-regulate. And he says a very interesting line. He says that moving forward, we're going to select for the people who can self-regulate. So natural selection is going to work to uh, the advantage of people who can self-regulate. Um, and I feel like in terms of technology, this ties in so much because like you said, Kavita, we've not had to think about these things before. It's happened so quickly that we haven't had the time to process that we need to change the way in which we live our lives so that the technology does not negatively negatively impact our lives. We're just being shown about how it positively impacts our lives. And it does 100%, right? It's made so much of an impact on our lives. Um but it's just happened too quickly for us to process the negatives. Yeah, thanks for that. And and Kavita, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. I just wanted to relate a very interesting uh, anecdote uh, with a five-year-old. 
um, and it really opened my eyes. And uh, because the parents had come to talk about too much of screen time and how this child wasn't uh, able to take themselves away from screen time. And I was sitting and chatting with them, playing with them a little bit. And uh, so he tells me, he said, uh, in my home, um, uh, the big, the biggest place that's there, I'm not using the words he used, is the TV. And my entire living room is placed and designed in a way that everybody has good access to TV viewing. This is how I've grown up. So he explained to me, but the most important thing is that when dad comes home, when dad comes home, he sits down in a place where he can watch the TV. When my mother wants to watch something, then she sits down in a place where the TV is in full, is in full view. If I come in front of them, they say, side ho jao. So the message that I'm getting in my home that I'm growing up in while they are all going out, working and all, is that even the home, even that room is designed for the most important part, which is the TV, which is the screen. And when my dad comes home, then if we are sitting down to eat, for example, sorry, am I frozen or is Neha frozen? Okay, yeah, okay, cool. And so, so he said, he said, when I um, uh, try and speak to him and if a call comes, he says, wait, and he goes on to the call. And he says, Bahut important. it's very important that I speak to this person rather than to you. So these are the messages that five-year-old has picked up about who is important in my household. I am not, even sometimes mom or dad are not, but the important thing is that little gadget or that big screen. And I just, I, I just sat there after this conversation and I just narrated it to the parents. And I asked them one question, how many screens do you have? And I asked this question now of everyone who comes to me with this. Please count at home the number of household members versus the screens. Mm -hmm. And in the urban setup that I work in, the answer usually is at least one or two tablets, one or two four, uh, uh, big TVs. Each person has a personal phone. Some of them have two. So three household members to seven screens is the usual ratio. Now, a child growing up is not going to think that the screen is not important. The salience of this is very high in our urban lives, at least. I don't know so much about the rural life. So I just wanted to narrate this. And uh, it was an eye opener for me. Uh, so, so interesting, Kavita, you say that um, I uh, met a, a three-year-old or thereabouts, or two and a half maybe, who zoom in uh, to the newspaper. I don't know if you can see my hands. And, uh, you know, as a mother of an 11-year-old, when, when I see my daughter's school entirely on the on the iPad and all their education is across multiple apps and uh, everything that they're doing is typing rather than writing the pen, the paper, the book uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, largely on the back burner, uh, I wonder, um, you know, uh, to, to Ira's point, how much people are you know, absorbing and what is the motivation to actually reach out in that quest for, for knowledge. Um, I'm looking at some of the questions here and Kavita, one of the questions that's come up is that as we talk about the internet as a way of accessing help, right? Making connections, getting content, understanding how to decode one's own mental health challenges, let's say, there is a lot of content out there. A lot of it is, is very variable in quality and, and highly questionable also sometimes. And oftentimes we just want to emulate something, you know, we pick up a quote be that person or live like that so how would you what kind of caution and discretion would you would you um, suggest when people are on the one hand leaning on the internet and all the all the tools and, and content available for getting help when it comes to different needs and mental health conditions and making sure that they're not sort of going down the wrong path or being misguided or uh, by chance sort of reaching the wrong tool for the wrong condition, you know, uh, because they are self-diagnosing and perhaps just wanting to solve for it themselves. And then we'd love to end by talking, Ira, also with you about the importance of self of uh, reaching out to professionals, right, in times of need. And, and we've seen that in the context of Amaha and also Children First, our work of actually people reaching out and getting the right support and, and care from therapists, psychiatrists, uh, uh, doing group work uh, and so on. So structured help and professional help later, but first just a caution and discussion around how to navigate uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the world of self-help online. Mm -hmm. 
So I'll, I'll attempt to answer that. I think uh, in, in my way of thinking right now, what the internet offers is information largely and some interpretation of the information. However, when we are looking at self-help, oftentimes it is more than that. There is a lot of intangibles that are not about information. That are uh, So language in that sense is sometimes re uh, a reductionist tool because language itself is a tool. And the way that the internet is developed is a lot to do with language and the presentation of information. So while that's great, when it comes to, so oftentimes now um, young people will come to us and say, I've read my symptoms, so I think I have this. Yeah, because they've actually seen it on Google. There's enough in the public domain to be able to give you the symptomatology. But for example, the symptom itself could be coming from somewhere else. And this is the intangible part of it, that I may be feeling worried, but it may be due to several different reasons that I could be feeling worried about something tomorrow. And those reasons are often something that only a interpersonal space and being able to ask what we call sometimes Socratic questioning or methodology where you're asking, so then tell me more, tell me why, tell me how much, tell me what it meant to you. So it is not about the phenomenon or the noun or the label, which is usually used as information, but about the why you reach that stage that is often, especially in mental health, especially in psychiatry, psychology, um, but often also in physical health. You may have fever due to th 160 different causes. So fever is information is a manifest or a symptom. Why I'm getting fever right now is something that requires a whole lot of other bits that sometimes can only be done through other means. And I think, therefore, I often feel that to discuss with someone. So I, I don't say, don't look at Google. I often tell young people, please inform yourself. Please look at Google. It doesn't matter but don't take it as truth. Come and discuss it with someone. So I often encourage people who come to me, I know if I prescribe something or write something down, they will go back home and they will look it up. I actually encourage it because it's beautiful. Look at you. You're well-informed. You want to take charge of your own life and your own condition. Beautiful. Come back and discuss with me. If it raises questions, let's, let me put whatever knowledge I may have gathered whatever experience I may have gathered to good use by discussing it. And this is something that I would say, not just about the net. You, you may get that information from a book. You may get it from another person. You may get it because especially in India, we all own each other's mental health and uh, we all have opinions on each other's well-being uh, and how it ought to be uh, done and what would take care of it. Um, so I think we have multiple opinions, which is great. But it then puts you in a place about how to decide. And I think oftentimes I say, because you are the person deciding, it's important to, to come and discuss either with a professional or with people who care for you and you trust already. Um, and, and sometimes um, what's difficult is people say, I read it from five different websites. Yeah, mm -hmm. and... There are simpler answers sometimes where all the five websites will say the same thing in math, in some scientific fact. But in medicine, often you will find not five, but 40 different answers to the same question. And I think that's where the confusion lies. And I think it's, it's good sometimes to have a discussion, maybe uh, come back to a professional, especially where self-help and mental health is concerned. The other, other thing I say is try it for a while. If it really resonates with you and you feel you can, because most self-help bits are not radical. They're truly at least something about self-help. Try it for a while. If you find you're not being able to, um, uh, you know, sort of implement it, then come and discuss why not. Because there may be something else going on that's keeping you from implementing it. And then we can work on that. So. I would say discussion, I would say, again, going back to the collective and maybe um, uh, I often say it's not just about people who are qualified as experts, but also other people with lived, lived experiences. I encourage young people to go into a community based group or a support group. And there are there, there are pearls of wisdom there sometimes that can help you, you know, the kind of wisdom that's available out there in the community is also very, uh, very good.
So yeah. that's that's what I would usually suggest. The only other thing that I might say is, and this is I think a bit old school, and it's more me rather than anything else, is that I often find, and this is more for me. I'm not sure it's for everyone, but the, the element of care and connect that comes through when you're sitting with each other in a room, and the intangibles of being able to whatever you want to call them vibes that's the newish word new age word the vibes you get in a room are real you may not be able to define them but they are very real and i think if you're open to understanding then the level of trust the care that can come through vibes and the connect that can come come through vibes can sometimes prove far more healing than just the information that's my personal experience and i'll leave it there yeah thank you for sharing that and i guess this idea of people sharing their personal uh, stories uh, the the experience strength and hope that they have gathered in their journeys is incredibly powerful um i know there is a question also that that asked anaira over to you on this uh, about the role of the arts right when we're looking at uh, our own journey of of healing of expression um of um, uh, of of recovery uh, and the role of the arts whether it's music or art, art based therapy i know you do a lot of that at agastu as well um so would love your reflection on that uh, it's one of the questions that our audience has um so i think something that i have realized is that output always helps so art is essentially expression and you are um putting out something um into the world and whether it's through writing or dance or any of those things um um apart from giving you another way to communicate with people and connect with people um a lot of times and especially i would say anxiety um is something that the feeling is too much is coming at me um and so when i put something out um it releases some of that um and it also helps me to connect and communicate with someone else on a like you said language is very reductionist a lot of the times you know it's uh, it's beautiful and great but then it's also frustratingly limiting um and so i think art really helps you to break that um barrier yeah um uh, thank you i know i know we're we're out of time and i wonder if we can pick up one or two more questions uh, one of the things that i'm picking up on from the question box is this idea of how do we control how do we protect how do we ensure that uh, our children and young people in our own minds are not attacked by um sort of uh, external um uh, whether it's information or harmful uh, inputs and i think the you know someone mentioned uh, earlier on about this idea of um uh, being able to regulate right uh, and being where does the ability to regulate come from right and and being able to uh, know what our boundaries are right and including what our, our mental spiritual emotional boundaries are whether we consume it online or offline in a direct known relationship or from a stranger right so if a stranger walking on the street comes and behaves a certain way with you what would your boundary be as against online right and and so the question really to my mind and and maybe this is just something to to leave everyone with is that rather than thinking about who all we can stop how can we monitor how can we control because it's just you know there are so many variables so many factors so many online platforms um and such little filters or ways of parental control uh, uh sometimes i think the real question is that you know how do we build that capacity to regulate and have some discretion and have uh, reach out to the internet or the world at large for the right reasons right towards the right outcomes uh, is that a way of um, empowering oneself educating oneself building one's knowledge base um creating more awareness and insight that is helpful uh, or is it something that is eroding one's self of self a sense of self and and taking away from oneself so it really the question of you know and and i know it's one of the questions as well where do we get our sense of identity um and how do we see our sense of self 
um, in the online world as well as offline. I think the same holds true. And the more we can build that muscle, and it is a muscle that we can build, right? We can we can try and uh, become more aware of it. We can try and uh, do things that are nurturing for it, whether it's online or offline, using tools across both. Uh, but how do we really build that internal sense of uh, boundary and uh, self-regulation so that we can protect and preserve ourselves? And how do we do that for, for our children as they grow? Because ultimately, the best way is for them themselves to be able to self-regulate. And it's probably the only sustainable way. Um, would love to just take a closing round from Kavita and Ira as well. But that's uh, that's really my reflection that I'd love to share and, and leave uh, for the room today. Ira? Okay, me first. Um, I think, like you said, Neha, it's, it's a muscle practice is the only way that you're going to be able to do it. And it's a sure shot way of doing it because anything you practice, you'll get. And um, thing is, people go on their own journey, right? So if I'm like, no, no, the internet's fine. I'm not addicted. I want to keep doing this. Then, you know, that's up to you. Uh, but if you find that you have no dips from scrolling on Instagram or anything, if you notice something is off um, and this is a topic that you are worried about, for yourself or for your kids or any of those things, then it's literally in your control. Try it and start practicing it and it will get better and you will figure out what works for you. So if someone is unaware that it's a problem for them or that they're, you know, if they don't think this is a problem, then cool. Um, but if you are noticing it, if it is bothering you, if you're even questioning it slightly, uh, know that it's in your control to be able to uh, to be able to regulate, to be able to practice, because as human beings, we have innately have that capacity. Um, and just a slightly side note thing that I wanted to add based on something Kavita said is uh, because I feel like young people sometimes are like, no, no, I can connect on the internet also. I can form true, meaningful connections. Um, and I think it's just important to note um, that I think the people who have interacted with the internet for a longer period of time uh, might be slightly better at forming meaningful connections through a virtual uh, setup uh, than the older generation. Um, and you do get vibes even across text messages. But it is very different from the vibes that you get in a real conversation and I think you owe it to yourselves to try both and to experience both and to have both in your toolkit because the other thing Hubman said is that a good life is the progressive widening and broadening of what brings you joy and so the internet doesn't need to be where you connect you can use all the different ways in which you can connect with people. And you should, because connection is literally the only thing you don't need money for, you don't need access to. If you don't have therapy, if you don't have medication, just make friends and work on your relationships and you will figure it out and you will feel okay. So email people, text people, DM people, send them memes, write them letters, go to their house and talk to them. Use all the means of communication. Um... And yeah, and, and I think ownership also falls on us in terms of uh, vetting our information. Because like we said, proximity access, just because it's the first answer you get, if you stop at that, then that's on you. Hmm. You're good at shifting accountability to yourself. <laughs> that's rare. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to take a minute to actually bring in the um, bit with parents because we haven't really talked about that. And I feel that oftentimes this particular bit of regulating a child's access to the Internet, but also about giving them access, both fall on a parent because there are no, no, no not no, but fewer stakeholders that are willing to take ownership of saying that, you know, we will teach self-regulation about the internet. It usually falls to the family or the parent and then the person themselves. So I think just one thing, and I think it's part of the questions as well, is at whatever age that you're going for, because what you're trying to promote is self-regulation, 
it is not control from outside that is going to necessarily help that skill set to form in the child. So many parents will go into this uh, loop of saying, I will keep the net away from my child. But please remember that is not going to increase their skill of self-regulation. And this is possible to do with something which ha which you have limited access to, but children are going to have access. It's everywhere. It is like the air. It is going to remain. So teaching them self-regulation at whatever stage and age you are at as a parent is going to be extremely important. And the key in that is collaboration rather than control. Um, so I have a small um, framework that I often tell parents to use, uh, and which is to say, don't just think about how much time the child is spending on the internet when you're talking about it. Think about what are they watching? So content is very important. Is it age appropriate or not, etc. How much are they watching? Definitely, there are guidelines towards that. Who are they watching with? Are they in connection with someone on the other side? Or who are they watching with? Are they watching with their friends? Are they watching it alone and isolating themselves because they can't connect with anyone else? And why are they watching it? Are they watching it because they're withdrawing from other places? Or are they watching it to actually connect to somebody? So who, what, how much, and why? And once you have answers with them to these, opening up a discussion and putting in prompts to help them understand, could there be other means to do all these? Because actually what we are getting to is the need being felt in the child, which is drawing them towards the net and the screen. And if that need is understood, then are there various ways, not just the internet, that we can actually do? So that's a that's, uh, uh, usual framework that I often um, because our schools and not colleges so much, but schools definitely have said no internet, no phones allowed into the school. However, with COVID, what happened was that all education become, became online, at least in most of the urban and B towns. Um, and the access to phones, smartphones and all became sanctioned. And uh, I think young people are very smart. They're much smarter than we are at our age. And uh, they have several tabs open at the same time, even when they're talking, even when they're in a class. And the multitasking is ongoing. And what are we paying attention to is up to them. So again, I think oftentimes it is about self-regulation and motivation from inside the person. And um, it may be important for schools to put this out as a life skill from a very young age. Because we have a captive audience there. And if there is a possibility that schools can do modules on life skills of self-regulation, um, I'll put in at the risk of sounding this thing also substances, um, uh, not just the internet. I think it would be absolutely amazing. And I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And actually, it uh, it just on that note also reminds me of um, what are the things that we can do in building this resilience and building these boundaries? What are the things that we can do uh, to to stay connected with oneself and stay connected with the world outside? You know, whether it's I give some examples, but whether it's connecting with nature or the world around us, you know, I mean, just simply uh, disengaging from all things digital, whether it is connecting with friends in real conversations, whether it's using the arts, uh, but just really finding ways of self-expression, self-connection, um, finding that that love and gratification and um, uh, sort of sense of acceptance and comfort or in the offline world, in the real world, you know, as in, in our relationships, in our families, in our schools uh, is also going to help because that is attractive. Ultimately, that is what people are seeking. And so if we're able to achieve more of that and parents are not perhaps always on their smartphones or teachers are, and schools are not always perhaps encouraging the use of tablets, then in that context, people have that connection. And that's really what we're seeking online or offline. Um, and so um, thank you so much for this uh, extremely uh, uh, sort of well-connected, engaged conversation uh, around mental health and uh, the online world around us. And we hope that um, this has prompted us to go within as individuals, whether as parents uh, for children or for our own selves as, as adults, um, and to go within and try and strengthen our own sense of connection with ourselves, with the world around us, uh, and being able to use tools online and offline uh, in the appropriate measure that they serve us. 
uh, and um, sort of further our horizons and increase our sense of wellness. Uh, and also, of course, the importance of getting help in time when it is needed uh, from professionals, uh, from peers, and from others in the community. Um, there was a conversation around how do we normalize this? Uh, and I think the normalizing is in these conversations. And so the more we're able to have mental health conversations uh, in our in our larger world, in our entire world, whether it's at the workplace, whether it's in schools or colleges, with, with peers, with friends, at a party, wherever it is that we're able to have these conversations openly, uh, we, will be, we will be normalizing it, we will be creating more acceptance, and one person sharing their story will always have others uh, sharing their stories back because we all give each other the, the confidence, the validation to be able to keep that conversation going. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Asia Society, for having us. And uh, it's it's been a pleasure uh, having this conversation on World Mental Health Day. Thank you.